Recording in progress. Welcome, everyone. My name is Robin Boardman, and this is Free as a Bird, Roger's uh, monthly talk from prison, where he introduces his latest transcendental work as he stares at the prison wall and thinks about what great wisdom he wants to share with us. Um, but really, it's not all about that great man of history great idea kind of thing he just wants us to get together and chat as a community basically um and i'm here to host it i've helped roger over the last few months set up a new organization called revolution in the 21st century we're trying to inspire people across the world with the idea of a democratic revolution based on deliberative democracy, on assemblies, of coming together in online calls like this and being able to talk to each other. We want to inspire people with those ideas, uh, educate uh, on how to make that happen. Together, we helped to co-found Extinction Rebellion and have learned over the last seven, eight years, many techniques for building effective social movements from, you know, classic Roger, you know, where do we put the uh, chairs in a in a room to the big ideas of like how do we um, resolve conflict within our organizations you know we've gone through it all together and we really want to help share that with all of our um, budgeting glowing uh, growing uh, social movements across the world and so together we've been writing a series of books We've been creating a podcast. We've been putting out articles, which I'm sure many of you have been reading along with. So uh, it's really a pleasure to help launch this organization and to have you all coming along to one of our Zoom calls. We're really helping to support Roger whilst he's in prison and others um, to share these revolutionary ideas. We're mainly focused on these two aspects. One is supporting social movements, social formations across the world who recognize that with the incoming social and ecological uh, shocks from the collapsing climate, we are expecting a revolution. And now that revolution could um, come about in some kind of 2008 uh, financial crash, Great Depression-esque moment. And if we don't have a compelling story, if we don't have a community, a social movement behind us that can, can jump into that moment, what the default is that those crises will be seized by fascism, as we've seen over the last hundred years. And so what we're trying to do together is build a community that can direct us towards a pro-social uh, revolution, one that can elaborate and build upon uh, the democratic practices that we've been working on, citizens' assemblies, people's assemblies, uh, social movements, protests. We want that to be the way forward um, rather than uh, being seized by some sort of strong man that says, this is how things are going to be and I'm going to be the dictator. We've had enough of that. We need to prepare for that. And the big thesis of our upcoming book, Design the Revolution, is that those are, revolutions are inevitable. So how we prepare for them in these um, perilous times is absolutely crucial. As I'm sure many of you have seen this week, there was a report that the carbon sinks of our world, the Amazon, the oceans, these vital uh, natural ecosystems that are that are some way helping to to balance out our massive emissions have actually not been sinking, have not been taking down carbon uh, over this last year, and that totally throws out many of the climate models. Up to this point, the whole idea of net zero and what we've been building towards has been based on those carbon sinks. So we're really looking um, at a devastating scenario. In fact, uh, in response to this news, Roger, in classic fashion, asked me, OK, what's the limit on Twitter for how many times I can say fuck? <laughs> and so I think he tweeted it something like 5,000 times <laughs> to just try and get across the scale of what this means. It's it's painful to just see it in another news report in a cycle when really it's fundamental to how we go forward. So we're looking at how can we build social formations around this collapse and how can we build a society that goes forward better together, that builds a balanced revolution of um, deliberative democracy 
and um, restoring these natural ecosystems that are so precious to our world, reducing emissions. These are some of the big ideas. And uh, Roger and I came together to work on that because we've both been in um, challenging circumstances over the last few years. I've been hit by long COVID, which has really Im uh, limited what I can do in terms of organizing and in-person events. So I'm really excited to get involved with an online community, work on books, and Roger, as you may know, has been under increasing repression, uh, regular police raids um, and searches and imprisonments before trials. So we wanted to work on something that was a bit less spicy together in behind the scenes that could, you know, connect a global community. So revolution in the 21st century, here we are. Uh, thank you all so much for coming along. I'm going to just uh, introduce a little bit of the structure uh, for this evening. For those of you who are in the evening, thank you, everyone else around the world too, whatever your time zone. Uh, I'm going to play a clip from Roger in prison. He is recorded for all of us. Um, it's around 20 minutes long. And then after that, we will um, have some time for breakout groups to discuss what we think of some of those ideas. You know, it doesn't have to be just necessarily about what Roger's saying, but what you're thinking around these topics at the moment. Um, really an open discussion and um, afterwards we'll have some time for a Q&A where uh, you can ask me some questions if you'd like and also um, do a poll where we can see how people want to get involved going forward whether that's you know if you want to join us in revolution in the 21st century helping inspire and educate or if you want to get involved with civil resistance projects on the ground or with assemblies uh, the community of uh, assemblies that are growing uh, across the world. We just got a 200,000 pound donation from um, some guy in Hollywood. So the assembly project is really taking off. And uh, yeah, if you want to help spark as assemblies in your area, so welcome. But we'll come on to that later. For now, I will grab the man himself and play him along. So I hope you enjoy a disrecorded session. I've made a small edit so people can also have um, captions to read along because sometimes the prison phone line is not the easiest, I must admit. So without further ado, here we are. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. I'm going to speak about a project I'm working on with Robin and the core team of Rev21. I have spoken about this before, of course, but its form is developing. It is the subject of the Spirit of Revolution podcast. So you can find out more by listening to it. The thinking comes out of a recognition that the climate movement and more generally the progressive left space in Western societies is in an ongoing crisis and is in no position to respond to the growth of the far right, which we see all around us. There are important lessons for this. We can notice that there have been no mass campaigns on carbon emissions in the sense of tens of thousands of people doing actions for some time, whether this is civil disobedience or conventional campaigning. You can put this down to deterministic reasons that the movements go in waves and we are on a downturn at the moment. And certainly the increasing repression, particularly in the UK, might be looked upon as a factor. But in doing so, I think we are really avoiding doing some deep analysis. We are just staying with the conventional materialist surface explanations. Being in prison, I've been able to have the time to reflect more on what I think is the key flaw in how we see our actions to save and or improve the world, as we put it. I think the core problem is not about the material difficulties we face but with the very way we see ourselves and the world. At the moment, and for the past year or two, a lot of people have stepped back, as it is called. There seems to be two underlying reasons. One is their utilitarian orientation to action. By this, I mean that people base the reason for doing action on the perceived results, the output. When those results do not happen, then they think the action or the strategy is, quote, not working, and they stop engagement. Secondly, and relatedly, 
they get emotionally exhausted due to their ego being attached to stopping the horrors we face and needing to try very hard to stop them. This leads to what is called burnout. And again, they stop engaging. What we face then is a crisis of resilience. I think, to be honest, I was initially responsible for contributing to this culture in so much as in 2019, I used utilitarian arguments to persuade people to go to London for the XR rebellion in the April of that year. Because as I put it at the time, quote, we can win. I don't think there's anything intrinsically problematic about instrumental thinking in so much as it's quite reasonable to make some considerations about whether an action is going to be effective or not. We make decisions like this every day. It's an unavoidable part of human cognition. The problem is that in our neoliberal culture, it is all encompassing. It's a totalizing rationale. So when it fails, people collapse because there's nothing else to fall back on. When I encouraged people to go to London in that fateful year, I wrongly assumed that the utilitarian analysis would be embedded by people within a broader virtue ethics orientation. By that, I mean, broadly speaking, that it is a good thing to do in and of itself. But instead, people just wanted results. Why was this? Because they are absorbed in the deep culture of this neoliberalism, the dominant ideology of our time. There's an important problem here. And the problem is that we fail to see that the real power of neoliberalism is at a cognitive level rather than at a macroeconomic level. We are all familiar with the conventional criticisms that neoliberalism creates massive inequality and environmental destruction. But more importantly, it is a system of social control that individualizes us and makes us think solely in terms of outcomes. Everything has to lead to something. If not, you are a failure. It's all about growth. As I say, there's nothing intrinsically bad about this. The problem is that it's massively out of balance. It's become a form of mind control. We need to frame our strategy then, not as some spiritual add-on to activism, but as a totally rational and political response to the neoliberal monster that we face. It is not enough to campaign about the economic stuff or the climate stuff. We have to decolonize our minds to be a real opposition. And to do this, we have to insist in a genuine revolution. And this revolution resides in transcendence. Transcendence is the real opposition to this project. And what transcendence means is the refusal to see the world and the self as a flat, material, atomized thing. We have to de-privilege this nonsense, just as we do with racism and other vile prejudices. Because to refuse people the ability to transcend is to deny their essential humanity. At the core of being human is the ability to rise above the world and to move outside of ourselves. It is what it means to be authentically free. In other words, we need to destroy the citadel of the secular, as I call it in the podcast, that insists that there is only one way to look at the world and replace this with a pluralistic approach. Because who has the right to tell us how to see? We then can look without prejudice at indigenous wisdoms, Eastern traditions, elements of Christianity, without embarrassment and without these orientations being patronized as being mere beliefs. While the belief of Wall Street of the dominant system is somehow an objective absolute. Money, 
power false. It is not absolute or objective. It is a lie. This then is what real radicalism looks like. It gets to the root of the fuckness of what is going on, the way the system stops us thinking properly in a pluralistic, open and curious way. A lot of this might sound familiar, but what I want to be absolutely clear about is that what I am suggesting is not something to do with the words spirituality or religion, or that we go off and do some quote in a word. What I want to argue is that this approach simply continues the neoliberal secular conceit because it does exactly what the system wants us to do, which is to compartmentalize, to privatize, to individualize, to do something just in your spare time, in your class on Thursday nights. It is insulated then from the systems of power. That is absolutely not what I'm talking about. There is quite a lot of intellectual history here, and I'm going to touch on it briefly. The problem of privatization of belief is not new. It has been consciously thought about and considered for the past 200 years. In particular, there was a big debate on this by Catholic personalist thinkers in the last century. The general point was that the modern state pushed the church out of power in the early modern period. Religion, the word religion, in fact, was not known in the Middle Ages, nor was it something understood by other cultures, for instance, by the Indian people when the British took over the subcontinent in the 18th century. Religion, the word religion, meaning private engagement in spiritual activities separate from law, politics, economics, is an ideological construction. Traditionally, all this was seen as one thing. For instance, the French Catholic philosopher Blondel insisted that each human action, without exception, is irreducibly mysterious, open, and uncontrollable. It cannot be defined by thought. It is imbued with the supernatural, as he called it. There is no human activity beyond the realm of God. This was not an attempt to go back to the church having state power, but it was a revolt against secular reason, which justified the violence of the state, whether the state was liberal or totalitarian. Of course, this raises issues about what practically this all means. And I will consider in the podcast some of the answers to that question. But for starters, I think we need to drop all the words like religious, spiritual, inner, which we are cognitively programmed to think of as, oh, that is an add-on, or even like that's just something else in addition to the main work of political change. We need to experiment here, and I am focusing on a more universal framing in the phrase, the way we see. And I think we need to start this process by rooting ourselves in the heart of conventional culture, the scientific, the empirical, how we see the world, the self and time, and how, once we closely focus on this, Ironically, the ideology of setness and atomization starts to fall apart. So the mental control system collapses from the inside, from within. It's not that like we have this spiritual thing and attack it all from the outside. In other words, what we say is that materialism, in fact, is just another religion, another spirituality. The problem is that it wants to rule the world, the whole space of human experience. But there are other ways of seeing that make more sense, that enable us to bring about revolutions, which, of course, is where all of this hits the road. As I'm about to discuss in the podcast, we can say, for the sake of argument, 
that there needs to be 10,000 arrests in an average Western democracy to put us in the ballpark of policy change. The point is, there is an objective point. It is basically a question of material pressure in the same way as in a labor strike. After a certain amount of pressure, you win. On the other side of the equation, we need the willingness of 10,000 people to engage in resistance to the point of arrest. And this is the point. This project is subjective, not objective, in the sense that it's about getting this number of people to change what's going on in their heads, their way of seeing. In other words, and this is the exciting thing, if we can move people away from a materialistic viewpoint, meaning there are terrible things that are happening, I need to act to stop them, to a more resilient, transcendent mental orientation, meaning to be who I am, I need to engage in this action, and I will detach myself from the consequences, then we could find many more people willing to take action because they are no longer trapped in a neoliberal way of seeing things. They do not see what they are doing as a cost to them. They don't have an, an accountancy orientation. They have rather a transcendent orientation. And this is a massive change. Again, there are plenty of organizational designs to be investigated on how people can be brought along a process to this position. But in principle, this represents a sea change in how we go about mobilizing, how we persuade people and motivate them. It returns us to the classic civil resistance paradigm of Gandhi, where the self-purification, as he called it, was not an optional spiritual add-on to the materialist main show. It was integral to the whole thing. Action was integrated into a whole worldview. And that is why his campaigns were so successful. People had massive resilience in the face of repression. So we know that some people will and do work all this out for themselves. And on the other hand, people can, en masse as it were, get into a collective transcendent state in situ as a crowd in the moment of physical confrontation with the authority. But what wins in the long term is deliberate organization and process. We have had several decades of hopelessly dysfunctional organizational culture where people look upon collective action a bit like going to McDonald's. You're offered a product, it's a transaction. If you don't like it, you go somewhere else. It's all about the individual. It is the way neoliberalism has destroyed collective opposition in Western societies by getting us to think that this is just normal. It's how it works. It is, of course, totally wrong. Before the neoliberal period, before 1989, organizations had leaderships, functional hierarchies, explicit values, memberships, organizational structures, clearly defined collective projects. You joined something, you acted together, you trusted the process of central decision making. And guess what? As we all know, it worked. Of course, you can be taken too far like anything else. It can go to extremes. It can end up in some sort of cult. There is always this danger, but at present, the danger comes from the other extreme, the me, me, me. This then is the direction of revolution in the 21st century, an international organization with structures and aims, not just another loose network which supposedly atomized individuals dip in and out of. Of course, the organizational model may have limited appeal at the present moment, but as the objective conditions of society get much, much worse, it will become a lot more attractive. It's about getting ahead of the curve then. People want something more solid, long-term and meaningful. 
and if the left does not offer this to people, then they will go to the fascist right, as we are already seeing, which, dare I say it, has no hesitation at all in creating organisations that promote its values. So, following on from Blondell, this is not going to be just about your heads. We are going to engage in a little action. Reality is rooted in action, not thought. Collective action is created through three specific things, I think. People commit to a collective act and trust in that decision. Secondly, they write down their commitment, reinforcing their commitment to the collective action. And third, they share that written document with others in the organization, with each other. So that is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you, I am asking you, to run on the spot for 30 seconds in the next 24 hours. Yes, that's right. Obviously, this is not going to bring down the system, but that is exactly the point of the exercise. I want you to focus not on the action, the outcome, but radically turn away from it to focus instead on what in the long term is more important, meaning what I've just said, that you have trust in a particular collective action, that you commit to it and then you do it. You act together with others. It is what you might call a little starting exercise to pull us out of our default mental individualism and default utilitarianism. Why me? Does this work? All that stuff. So Robin's going to give you the details. I think it's going to be fun. Don't worry. At least you're not in a prison cell. On that note, I will stop. I wish you all the best. And remember, we are all on some process here. Onwards and upwards, as they say. Take care. All right, there we go. Yeah, I see a few jazz hands going. Nice to hear from him, right? <laughs> amazing that we get this set up and call and i will continue on my little individual spiel for just one more moment before i allow you to get that collective action and uh, ideas going to talk about what roger just mentioned um and i'm very intrigued i'll give a bit more introduction to that in just one second but before i do i wanted to give a little uh reminder that everything we're doing right now um costs quite a lot of money the prison phone calls are not cheap and we're trying to build a collective community in this spirit of what Roger was talking about, of membership, of taking part in something, in donating together, in um, contributing something together. It means a huge deal. We'll be doing these calls every month going forward, um, and hopefully a few more as we develop up uh, our organization. We're going to give a bit more of an introductory talk to revolution in the 21st century, this thesis, this idea of the incoming and the inevitable revolution with a talk from Roger, with um, more on his podcast, which you can find also on the website link I just shared, um, the Spirit of Revolution podcast. If you're looking for it on Spotify, it's still under Design the Revolution right now. It's just like a, a bottom episodes and you can find out more there. Um, yeah, if there's any final uh, questions or anything anyone wants to ask me before we wrap up, I'd be very happy to take it. Uh, I see one from Robbie. Go ahead. Um, what's going to happen with the questionnaire that you sent out? Are you going to try and put people in touch with each other according to whether they ticked bullet one, two or three or something? What do you know? Exactly. Yes. So um, depending on what you filled in, uh, I've got your the little databases and I'll try and connect people in with each other um, either through your country uh, for the A22 uh, group. If you're in Italy, then you can all, you know, can get involved with the Nazione. Or uh, if you're with the Rev21 people, I'll invite you along to an induction for your country on a Sunday with me and Ginny. And I can give you a bit more about the principles and the values and how to get stuck in with the, with the big job ahead of us. So yeah, all of that will come with some um, more information afterwards. Anyone else have any final thoughts or questions? Yeah, uh, Gia. Yeah, one question. How do you think a, a system change could look like what to for a revolution? Which which goal do uh, one do we want to reach? Thank you, man. Why yes. Why don't you speak about this? 
Yes, please. Yes, totally. So one of the um, in design the revolution in the book, um, which is based on the podcast series, which you can listen to from Roger for two hours going in depth into his life work of um, building social movements, uh, his kind of magnum opus, we jokingly called it at the beginning and ended up actually being just that. Um, he goes through how to build social movements and then the system change we want to build towards is on one level this kind of personal transformation we've been talking about it's a development of sociability being together in communities being welcoming and being connected and collective in how we organize things going forward and moving away from this atomized individualized idea of um, you know, neoliberal society and how it's organized based on wealth accumulation, etc. So this personal transformation, but systemically, the actual structural uh, change, I think you're probably mainly alluding to, is going to be the implementation of citizens' assemblies into our constitutions. So in the UK, for example, this looks like replacing the existing House of Lords uh, kind of... Um, centuries old aristocratic form of even hereditary um, honors and power uh, into a house of the people which we're campaigning on with us assemble which will be uh, representative of the uk population and be able to form a checks and balance system to the house of commons and so if you look at the Sortitian Foundation, um, they have uh, several graphs of what this looks like, and it's beautiful to see, particularly in places like the US, replacing the Senate with a Citizens' Assembly, where you then move from a very male, white, millionaire class uh, deciding huge amounts of uh, public policy into a um, half men, half women, uh, you know, 15% black and brown people, uh, balance out by income levels it's beautiful to see what that transformation would look like so that is a big part of the change that we're campaigning on and roger even goes a step further in the podcast to talk about how multiple citizens assemblies on different topics um, could help guide us forward um, so having that at a structural constitutional level and locally also building these assemblies in our communities as have been done across the world in um, in projects like Porto Alegre, where they um, transformed their city budgeting system by uh, having the community actually decide upon it themselves, whether it's in Java in northern uh, Syria, where they also built up these assemblies or even from a very street level to decide together how do they want to move forward. So these assemblies, when they come together, are this huge source of inspiration and people power they're the ecstasy as roger calls it in the uh in the podcast because it's a chance to give what we cannot do so much in our society which is actually speak and like talk about how we feel about these problems and work together towards some kind of solution and just to give a last example in the uk with uh, the assemble project which some of you might have just signed up for if you're excited about it it's really cool um we've been putting those assemblies as part of then an election process. So the assembly decides who do they want their candidate to be? Who's gonna stand as an independent or in a new political party to challenge uh, the existing structures and, and stand up for democratic revolution? This is, uh, there are many more parts to it, but that's to give you the, the top line of what we look like, that structural change to look like. Now, on that note, we're quarter past the hour and I really want to thank everyone for coming along today. And we're going to wrap it up there. Please do, if you can, um, take part in the community, throw in what you can, make that commitment um, going forward. And uh, I'll catch you next time. Adios, everyone. See ya. Goodbye. Take care. Yes, really right, nice man. to have you all. Thanks, mate. See Thanks. You thank you very much. Adios. Okay.